I'm David Levy. I'm dean of the Duke Law School, and it may seem strange to say, welcome to Duke um, at this point. Uh, this is obviously the place to be, and I desperately wanted to be here this morning to properly welcome you. But those of you who tried to get out of New York yesterday will know um, why uh, I'm delayed here. Uh, I want to acknowledge, uh, first of all, the incredible work of Professor Charles, Professor Jones, and Professor and watch a willig for pulling this together. A conference of this magnitude doesn't just happen, and uh, there was a tremendous amount of work. And I know that there were some wonderful Duke Law students who also participated in the planning and the conception of this conference. I'd also like to acknowledge Judge Damon Keith, who's here and is one of the spectacular figures. Welcome to Duke, uh, Judge Keith. Uh, he and I were colleagues for many years, and he's one of the, the great judges in the federal system and in the nation. As, so I suppose historians would say that all times are times of transition, and that's probably true in some sense. Um, but the idea of this conference is that perhaps we are at an inflection point in, in civil rights, and that, that seems correct to me. And at this time, it, there's an opportunity, it, I think an incredible opportunity, maybe a responsibility for academic study, for those who are in the academy to do the kind of work that needs to be done if further progress is going to be made. What, we, what some of us learned by reading the Department of Justice's Ferguson report was quite surprising. If you picked up that report, and if you were in my shoes, I expected to read something about police departments and uh, their use of deadly force. In, instead, I was riveted by the description of how the legal system worked on the ground, by how the court in the local municipality had been hijacked by the municipal finance system and had become, instead of something where people could look for justice and for, um, uh, for, for, for a, f a fair resolution, it was part of a process of getting revenue, essentially from poor people, and sending them down the destitution pipeline. So if we're going to make progress, we have to understand how our system works and not be surprised all of a sudden to find out that it is not working terribly well. We need to focus on the infrastructure of our justice system if we're going to make progress in civil rights. As Professor Zakharov said in his Curry lecture here last year, one of the greatest improvements we could make to make voting fairer and more accessible in this country is actually to have voting machines that work. We also need to have a legal system that works. And we can't have a legal system that works unless we understand how it is working. So the first thing we need is data. We need data on how police departments behave, how courts behave, how, how they set bail, how fines and fees are set, how these very local courts, which are so different in every municipality, sometimes police courts, sometimes village courts, sometimes mayor courts, how are these courts working? And then we need to understand uh, what I'm calling the destitution pipeline. And then we need, to, we need to fix it. So in this past year, I've been devoting much of my time to trying to understand what is happening at this low level or the street level of the legal system with the Standing Committee on the American Judicial System of the ABA with our own Judicial Center and at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And I hope that some of the people in this room will share my interest in this topic, and I'd be very pleased to talk with you further about it if this is something that interests you. We need data, and then we need law reform. Thank you, welcome to Duke.
Thanks so much to the Dean for having us here and for the organizers for bringing us together. My name is Christina Rodriguez. I'm a professor at Yale Law School, and I'm honored to be moderating this session of Outstanding Immigration Law Scholars and Activists. It's definitely a propitious moment in which to be talking about immigration and civil rights. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the 1965 Immigration Act, which we've already heard a great deal about. On the one hand, it was a civil rights achievement because it marked a self-conscious decision that our polity would no longer be consciously constructed based on national origin or race. But it was a choice for formal equality of treating all people around the world exactly the same way, as opposed to a choice for substantive equality, because it also came alongside an elision of the historical relationship the United States has had with Mexico, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. And the quotas that were established for the Western Hemisphere, as has already been noted, were the seeds for today's unauthorized population, one of the central civil rights challenges of our time, in my opinion. Since 1965, it's become clear that almost nothing about our views on immigration and its place in the construction of our identity as a nation and in our polity has been resolved. And today is a moment for, simultaneously, for simultaneous optimism and despair. And I think we'll hear notes of both uh, from the panelists today. It's a moment for optimism because of the way in which immigrant youth and immigrants' rights activists, generally speaking, have had a significant impact on law and policy, on policing, on the construction of the presence of the unauthorized migrant inside the United States, and on the meaning of immigrants in our polity. But it's also a moment of despair. Uh, today's Republican Party politics in 2015 looks very different from the politics of the same party in 2000, when there was a chance that our system might be transformed through the energies of a Republican president. But one of the questions that we'll discuss is whether we're facing a unique moment in, of nativism in our history, or if in fact this is a perennial, something that we constantly have to struggle to overcome. And what are the methods either to put that to rest finally or to overcome it when it arises? So to answer these kinds of questions and to talk about the role of immigration, immigrants, immigrants' rights in our conceptions of civil rights and in the meaning of, uh, our, of our nation, we have a stellar panel uh, who I'll each introduce briefly and who will each speak for 20 minutes, or sorry, not 20 minutes, two minutes. <laughs> on, I'm sure each of them would like uh, 20 minutes, but on the subjects of okay. law and policy, <laughs> activism and organizing, and civil rights and immigration in a multiracial context. So to my far left is Hiroshi Motomura. He's the Susan Westerberg Prager Professor of Law at UCLA and was formerly at UNC down the road. He's the well-known author of Immigration Outside the Law, Americans in Waiting, and two leading case books on immigration law and refugee and asylum law. Next to him is Jennifer Chacon, who's a professor in the School of Law at UC Irvine, currently visiting at Stanford Law School, who's also taught at UC Davis. She's the author of numerous articles on uh, immigration law, uh, criminal law, civil rights, and constitutional issues. Next to her is Lacey Abrego, who's a sociologist and a professor in the Cesar Chavez Department of Chicana Studies at UCLA. And her current work uh, focuses on the role of gender and legal status in determining the well-being of Salvadoran families separated by migration. And she also works on the meaning of unauthorized status for immigrants themselves. Next to her is Alejandra Go, oh, I'm sorry, you switched places, is Maria Elena Incapié, who is the executive director of the Los Angeles Office of the National Immigration Law Center, leading organization in advocacy for the rights of low-income immigrants. And Maria Elena herself has been at the forefront of many advocacy battles and is still so today as part of NILK. Next to her is Alejandra Gomez. Uh, Alex is a community organizer, and she is most recently with Lucha, Living United for Change in Arizona. She began her organizing career in response to Sheriff Joe Arpaio's targeting of immigrant communities in Maricopa County, Arizona, and began with Maricopa Citizens for Safety and Accountability to organize uh, immigrants and others in Arizona against these tactics. And finally, we have Robin Lenhart, who's a professor of law at Fordham Law School and writes on the subjects of race, family, and the marriage. And Along with Jennifer Gordon, she's also written uh, persuasively and impressively about how to bridge the gap in discussions of race and immigration. So with that, I will turn it over to Hiroshi to begin our two-minute discussions. Okay, I'll start my stopwatch. Um, so uh, since I'm the first speaker, I thought what I'd do is lay out a few themes, I think, that uh, will set the stage for some of the other remarks. But um, I think, as Christina mentioned about the 65 Act, um, it's the 50th anniversary. And 65, I'm talking about the 65 Immigration Act, and I think it's clear that political history shows that it was very much part of the coalitions that 
brought us the 64 Civil Rights Act and the 65 Voting Rights Act. But um, to go over what it, what it did, I mean, it ended the national origin system, which was an express attempt to maintain the ethnic mix of this country as it existed in, in, in 1890. Uh, and it greatly restricted African and uh, Asian immigration. Um, but the interesting thing about this, and Kevin Johnson talked about this a bit earlier, is that at that time there were bars on uh, Latin American immigration, uh, qualitative, so-called qualitative bars, such as having enough financial resources, but those were selectively applied and there was no numerical cap. So the trade-off in 1965 was to impose for the first time numerical limits on uh, um, labor, basically, uh, from migration, migration from, from um, from uh, Latin America, and it, as Kevin mentioned, uh, laid the foundation for undocumented immigration in this country because the economy had become very dependent on and really sort of uh, looked to Latin American labor for a disposable, flexible workforce. Uh, but the law cut that off. Um, the law cut that off. It made it very difficult to come to this country lawfully. And so what that led inevitably to was a real mismatch between law in the books and law in action. Uh, law in the books says 11 million people are here undocumented without lawful status, but the law in reality is that uh, the economy has uh, continued to rely and the law has looked the other way, creating a situation where 11 million people live in a limbo, land, uh, limbo area, limbo zone, uh, and that the difficulty here is that you have um, a tremendous number of in-between statuses that I think naturally emerge because people have become parts of communities, uh, people become uh, parts of the workplaces, uh, people have citizen children, and that that calls out for various forms of recognition. We see that most recently in the Deferred Action Programs, but we've seen this for many years. On the other hand, we have the, uh, the superficial rule of law saying that these people are not supposed to be here. What does that do? It basically means that it devolves uh, authority to people who make up the law on a very discretionary basis, often on the street, with regard to uh, the power of arrest, which is the power essentially to decide who goes in the deportation system. So, so the, 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 the trade-off here is that you know, we had, in some sense, the civil rights uh, victory coming to immigration law in 65 and superficial equality. But uh, we have had, essentially, um, this creation of this in-between statuses, um, and uh, I think that that's um, one of the challenges that we um, have to struggle with today. Uh, I want to thank the organizers, and that's all I'll say because I have two minutes. Um, which, <laughs> no, thank you to Trina, to Guy, and to Angela, um, and uh, to the dean for his words of welcome, and to the students, um, Anna, Stephanie, and all the others who worked so hard. Um, I have, uh, as I said, just two minutes, which gives me time to make some sweeping statements and gross generalizations uh, that we can hopefully flesh out um, as we work through. I've been thinking, uh, especially as the first panel talked about how the law has been reformed in many ways to creatively produce race-neutral categories, the criminal, uh, the illegal, the alien, the illegal alien, the criminal illegal alien, uh, as some senators have said, uh, even he and she, alien, citizen, all of these terms that legitimate discrimination ultimately against marginalized racial groups. And so I want us to use this conference in part as an opportunity to think about the implications of this uh, kind of legal production of neutral categories uh, for how we think about civil rights going forward. And I want to suggest that we need to reorient our understanding of civil rights from a project of achieving equal citizenship. Um, um, to one of achieving equal dignity and justice beyond the bounds of formal legal citizenship and developing a community identity that doesn't rely so heavily on national borders uh, to shape uh, our sense of belonging and community. Um, Dean Moran proposed that we focus on immigration, economic inequality, and she said terrorism, but I think her later comments sort of expanded that to think about policing, policing of terrorism, policing of immigration, policing of kind of mundane street uh, offenses um, as places to focus when we think about the contemporary contemporary civil rights movement, and I agree. So I think Hiroshi's talked about the way that our immigration law has moved um, in ways that have given us sort of a whole host of people who live here, who exist here, in, in liminal legal statuses or in-between statuses, um, who don't have full uh, legal rights, um, who may have sometimes some temporary protections that allow them to be here, um, but who don't uh, have a path uh, to kind of the ultimate uh, goal of citizenship. Um, and that, is, that leaves us with a very complicated 
complicated reality on the ground when it comes to the thinking about the shaping of movements. Um, and so Lacey will talk a little bit more about what those, uh, what those uh, in-between statuses look like and feel like uh, for people on the ground. But I want us to think very specifically, and I'm already out of time, about the way uh, that we can think about the parallels between what's happened in this area and what's happened in criminal justice, because criminal justice is something that isn't in the big room this morning and, and needs to be with us in the big room this morning. So I want us to think about the increasing severity, um, not just in the uh, immigration sphere, but increasing severity in the criminal law sphere. I want us to think about mass incarceration, even as we think about um, mass, uh, mass immigration detention, growing immigration detention in our detention of women and children uh, uh, along the U.S.-Mexico border. I want us to think about uh, the ways in which there are a whole host of people who are maybe not in prison and jail, but living with liminal legal statuses, who are citizens, uh, but who are on parole, who have probation, who are being policed through gang injunctions, who are being policed through other forms of civil mechanisms that may not have the procedural protections of, of the criminal law backstop, um, but whose lives therefore look equally uh, tenuous and tentative. Um, so I want us to think about these parallels as we have the conversation today. I'll just say quickly that it's such an honor to be here, and thanks for everyone who made it possible. <clears throat> I'm speaking and reflecting on uh, all of the experiences that I've had interviewing dozens and dozens of, of immigrants and participating countless hours in protests, marches, rallies, press conferences, uh, mostly in the immigrant rights movement in L.A. And so thinking about that along with my fellow sociologist Cecilia Mejivar about the ways that people use language that is very similar to how they express feeling in civil war, thinking about the violence that we enact on immigrants. And when we say violence, a lot of people think mostly about interpersonal, directly physical harm. And there's other forms of violence that are also important that we need to really think more deeply about. There's structural violence, the kind that happens when you don't allow people to access basic necessities through the social institutions that we have, through employment, through education, through health care. And when we don't give people those rights, that access, it's very difficult to thrive, to survive even. So there's that kind of violence, and there's also symbolic violence, which is what happens when we see these patterns of inequality in our society and begin to internalize the idea that this is normal, that it's acceptable, that it happens because people somehow didn't work hard enough, didn't follow the rules. Um, so there, there's those forms of violence that are happening every single day to immigrants, their families, their communities. And so we offer this idea of legal violence because we want to locate the law, the way that the law is implemented, the way that we provide authority as a society to law and the language of law. That is the source that justifies our turning away when we see a racist judge terminating parental rights to a mother because he believes that she opted to break a law in being here without authorization and therefore is not fit to be a mother. When we see that, when we see women and children having to spend months and months in detention centers that are immigrant prisons and look the other way because somehow they broke the law. So the language of the law legitimizes that. And I want to offer that as a way to think about how none of what we think of as undocumented immigrants is inherent in them, but really created through the law. Great. Buenos dias. My name is Maria Elena. I'm really honored to be here with all of you today, and thanks for making the time to be at this conference. Thanks to the organizers, both the law students and faculty, who had the foresight of organizing this conference today, which is the one-year anniversary of President Obama's executive actions on immigration, um, which really are the most significant immigration policy changes that we've had in, in recent history. And they came about not so much through legal advocacy, although there was clearly a role for lawyers, but it really came about from immigrants themselves, people who were directly impacted by some of the worst records. President Obama, under his administration, has deported over 2 million immigrants, more than any previous administration. And immigrants themselves, domestic workers, work, mothers, fathers, immigrant youth, put their lives on the line, engaged in civil disobedience of many types, which I was honored to be a part of. Um, and so as an immigrant myself from Colombia, um, it's an honor for me to lead an organization, um, the National Immigration Law Center, which was founded specifically for low-income immigrant families like mine 
and we really see our role as legal and policy experts in terms of supporting organizing, really supporting the role of immigrant communities that are directly impacted, having a, a role and a protagonist role as a social change act, act uh, agents, making sure they are the protagonists of the changes that we're bringing about. And as lawyers and Kevin mentioned this earlier, we have a role in that, um, but really needing to make sure that it's being led by those who are directly impacted by policies. Um, the executive actions were have been the deferred action to this temporary protection from deportation for parents of U.S. citizens has been blocked in the courts. A few days after President Obama made his announcement last year, Texas and 26 states. Not surprisingly, if you look at the map, it's the same states that just voted to try to block uh, Syrian refugees from coming to the country. It is very much, much a political decision by those states and those mostly Republican governors or all Republican governors. Um, and that lawsuit has blocked the implementation of these programs. Today, just an hour ago, the Department of Justice filed its cert petition before the Supreme Court. Um, we at the National Migration Law Center are committed to making sure that we're working with the communities to make sure that the 5 million U.S. citizen children whose parents would benefit from these programs have a role. We see this as a movement. It's one of the most important immigration cases to go before the Supreme Court, and we really see this as an, uh, a, a lawsuit that will allow us to help shape um, the, the future of this. And I'm just going to end by showing one picture. We can get it on. Maybe not. Maybe I'll show it later. Oh, there you go. And this is what's really at stake, and I'm happy to talk about this um, afterwards. This is a note that a mother shared with me recently of her 13-year-old daughter um, who she found this note of hers. Um, this was written by Lupita in Southern, in Southern California um, who had just drawn this, this picture. Uh, her father was recently um, detained by immigration. He's, we're fighting his immigration removal, his deportation. Um, and the fact that a 13-year-old has to write about her secret being that her father is going to be ripped apart from her, her family again um, is really disgraceful and un-American. And it's the level of policing that's happening in all communities of color. Um, the fact that our children have to fear, whether it's police or immigration agents, in their schools, in their homes, in the streets, um, is really what I think this conference is really all about. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so powerful. Um, hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here to be with this amazing group of folks. Um, as a community organizer, I think it's important for me to note that I don't think that I got into this in an intentional way, but rather that my life circumstances actually brought me to organizing. So I want to show a video, and what I think I want to do is really emphasize the role of organizing and how we really have to work together now with legal, political, and grassroots organizations to be able to advance our work, because so much of our work, we started on the activist side, and then we were blocked by the courts. So we're seeing all of these new developments in the way that um, our communities are really being suppressed and oppressed. Um, but I also want to do the work of bringing those people into this room because we talk about these folks, but we need to know who they are, know their faces, know their stories. So I'm going to show a video, and I believe I'm going to go over time. <laughs> so just to let you know. Um, but this is an action that we did in Nogales, Arizona, on the border. And it, it really shows the family separation um, that we're talking about. Um, and this was done at United We Dream. What is this? Allow. Oh, allow, allow. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Technology is not my thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. and hasn't come back. I haven't seen her since then, so it's been over six years. She always asked me of, um, what do you do? What do you do with, why do you always go to D.C. or why are you always in this thing? Like, And she's always scared. I'm like, don't worry, Mom, there's a lot of us. But I'm also a little angry um, that this is the only way that I can see her is through a fence. <laughs>
So this action actually happened, and it still kind of brings me to tears. <laughs> Um, this happened when there was a gridlock in Congress where we couldn't move the actual legislation forward. So the conversation was getting caught up in politics, and we wanted to actually show what was happening with families um, beyond just like the legislation, the words, the writing, the policy. Um, that was a very powerful. Uh, I'm glad you shared it. Thank you. Um, I, I want to, uh, first of all, it's great to see everybody. Uh, it is really a gift to be here and be part of this panel and this uh, conversation that we're having about uh, civil rights today. I wanted to take up uh, Kevin Johnson's uh, suggestion that we, we speak very specifically about places where solidarity on the issues that we've been talking about is possible. And so I want to talk about one of those, um, one of the good moments that Christina uh, uh, talked about in introducing the panel, one of the highlights. Uh, and that involves the fight for 15, uh, the idea of. Uh, uh, m ensuring that uh, we have uh, a minimum wage that really makes it possible to live, right? Identifying $15 as the minimum uh, necessary to sustain uh, a, a good, meaning minimally good life, I should say. That's had a lot of power, a lot of su success politically. You hear, uh, you know, presidential candidates talking about it. You see movement in states like New York, Governor Cuomo just making an announcement about uh, uh, the minimum wage being 15 for state workers, uh, for example. I want to talk about it, though, as a place where we see uh, different communities coming together, immigrant communities, uh, uh, African-American communities, for example, coming together uh, to advocate uh, for change. Uh, and I think this is important because very often we think about those two uh, communities in particular as, as being at uh, odds with one another. That's something that the media really plays up on, that we're, uh, they're sort of at each other's throats. And in this movement, the movement for 15, though, I think you have, uh, uh, those who've organized it have found a place where the interests of these groups really are uh, aligned. Um, so why does it, why has it worked? Uh, I think there's an intersectional approach. There's a, there is an appreciation that low wage work is a place where people of color are overwhelmingly uh, represented, no matter how they came to be in this country. Uh, there's a focus on uh, uh, low wage jobs that are public facing, right? Where People are engaged with communities, uh, with uh, community members. They know them. It resonates, I think, in ways that focusing on what might happen in a narrow workplace uh, might not for others. Uh, it uh, is about a place where people actually come in contact with one another. Some of the research that Jennifer Gordon and I uh, have done in the past has suggested that uh, efforts to uh, create and sustain solidarity among workers works best <coughs> when you have workers who are actually know one another, actually work with one another. So you might have workers who, for example, work in the same hotel, but they might be doing totally different types of work. That's a barrier uh, to solidarity. But I think that the, the 15 uh, movement has found a place uh, where you don't have that kind of barrier. It involves real institutional support by unions, I think research also suggests that that is really critical to maintaining uh, solidarity uh, to the kinds of alliances that can move uh, civil rights forward for, for everyone. And so I think we need to, in the conversation that we have in the next hour or so, my time's up already? <laughs> She's ruthless. Uh, uh, we need to think about uh, what we can do to sustain it. What kinds of institutions do we want to, uh, to be involved? What kinds of interests we want to uh, focus on? I'll just say this, and it goes to something that uh, 
uh, Rachel Moran said earlier, uh, I didn't hear Rachel saying we shouldn't think about immigration as a civil rights uh, issue, but I, I heard her saying we need to sort of complicate uh, how we talk about immigration and what brings people to this mm -hmm. to this country and, and and what the sort of push factors might be and how they might be different than for for native workers. But I think the movement for 15 again. Uh, hits a, hits a sweet po uh, spot in that immigrants who uh, maybe are thinking about what a dollar here in the United States can buy elsewhere uh, find themselves aligned with workers who have no choice but to spend their dollar here uh, <coughs> uh, can come together and say, look, uh, let's let's work so that we get uh, what we what we all need, whether we're going to use it here ultimately or uh, or or elsewhere. I'll, I'll stop. More to say. Mm -hmm. So thanks to all. And I'll, I'll begin with a question specifically for Robin, uh, but that anyone on the panel uh, should feel free to answer and also would be uh, reasonably directed at any, a, any one of you. And I'll uh, let the audience know that we're going to go until 1240 so that we'll have plenty of time for some questions after our discussion. <laughs> So it's heartening to hear about the possibility of um, cross-group organizing in the context of this particular um, substantive organizing venture. But to bring one of the themes that was raised in the last panel into this discussion, how do you situate that within a larger narrative where uh, low-wage immigration um, or immigration of people who, who ultimately earn low wages is part of this larger phenomenon of globalization that has chipped away at the security and status of the, the middle class. Um, and there are a lot of culprits uh, behind that, and there are a lot of vectors um, in that development, but immigration is a piece of it. And so how do we think about immigration and inequality um, and workers' rights all together, um, given the, the kinds of ideas that were raised in the, in the last session? Um, I, I do think focusing on, um, I think inequality, focusing on inequality, especially around work, one of the reasons that I focused on the movement uh, for 15 is that it really focuses on, uh, I think, a pathway that has been really essential both for um, uh, native-born, low-wage workers, particularly those who are African-American, and for uh, uh, new low-wage uh, Im immigrants, which is work, right? That's a place to secure one's standing, to secure the... Uh, uh, um. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, let me move up uh, a little bit, too. Uh, whoa, big, big difference. Uh, uh, so I, I, think it's, I think it's important to focus uh, on... in on work and thinking about this and the places of inequality. I'm not quite sure I'm getting at your, your answer, but I, I, this, the story about immigration uh, and the ways in which it might uh, have, uh, uh, I think this is, this is not a story that I buy into, but the media story about immigration and the ways in which it undercuts, for example, native-born African Americans. Uh, I think really overlooks the inequality uh, that low-wage workers uh, face, black and um, uh, new immigrant Latinos. This is the work, this is what I focus on. I don't mean to say that only new uh, Latinos are new immigrants that are coming from, from all over, but that's the, that's the focus that we've, uh, that we've had in our, our work. And so I, I think that we need to... Uh, uh, look at the, the ways in which that inequality within that space gets created. Uh, uh, there's not enough, I think, focus on uh, employer bias and employer choice uh, and the ways in which employers have degraded uh, uh, work. It's not uh, new immigrants coming in and automatically uh, displacing native-born workers. I think there's a, there is an active role that employers are playing in uh, uh, degrading the quality of, of work. Uh, Leticia Salcedo, who, is she here? Uh, she's talked a lot about Title VII uh, and brown uh, spaces. So I, I think that, I don't think immigration is the source of that inequality, but I think that 
it has been an opportunity for uh, uh, employers uh, in particular uh, to keep uh, some native-born workers and immigrants within those uh, degraded, low-wage uh, spaces and to, to perpetuate inequality for, for those groups. Sure, definitely. So I think it's a really important question because I think at the core of the experience of workers that are earning low wages, it's exploitation, right? I mean, let's think about immigration has often served the role, and one of the reasons some will argue we don't have immigration reform yet is because there are corporate, there's corporate greed that prefers the status quo, which is to have cheap labor. Um, and so seeing immigrants as a commodity for being able to um, pay them low wages, sub-minimum wages, exploit them, not provide, you know, uh, classify them as independent contractors instead of employees, um, engage in sexual harassment and sexual assault because the woman, the, the female worker may fear reporting that employer to immigration, to, to the authorities as for a labor violation because she fears deportation. And so I think um, the, 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 the myth and particularly the narrative of immigrants come to steal jobs um, and then the, the counter narrative, which is um, US, the reason immigrants are taking these jobs is because US workers are not, um, don't want those jobs or are lazy and aren't taking those jobs it's code for race. I mean, let's just be real, okay? So on the one hand, immigrants are here taking jobs. Like, no, they're coming for economic opportunity, just like all previous immigrant generations have come for their parent, for their children, for the future of their children, just the way my parents made the sacrifice to come and bring 10 of us to the United States. Similarly, we as immigrant advocates have a responsibility. I believe it's a moral responsibility to challenge every time folks out there say that U.S. workers don't want, you know, they don't want those jobs. It's code for, I'm just going to say it, real talk, black workers are lazy and don't want those jobs, right? So we, as immigrant advocates, have to challenge that and say, no, U.S. workers don't want those jobs because they don't pay enough, because they're exploit, they're, they're in uh, working conditions that are exploitative, and U.S. workers, like immigrant workers, want jobs that respect their dignity, jobs that allow them to support their families, jobs that allow them to fulfill their full human potential. And so for me, so much of the work and the work that we do at the National Immigration Law Center is how do we come together as Asian, black immigrants, Latino immigrants, and African Americans, and U.S. workers that are also pay getting paid low wages, that aren't able to make uh, make ends meet either. How do we come together to build a more robust economic justice agenda in this country that's more akin to Dr. King's vision for the poor people's agenda that really lifts up the vote for all of us? And so I feel like so much of the work really needs to be there um, and, and not giving in to so much of the, the narrative. So I think everyone on the panel wants to get in on this uh, line of thinking. So we'll go with Hiroshi, uh, then Lacey, then Alex. Well, I just want to offer a reflection on kind of the moment we're in, and this is going to oversimplify things a little bit. But um, to me, there are there are three main three major issues um, I think about quite a bit, and one is one is freedom freedom of movement, and um, what we allow and what what, what we recognize, and and, um, and 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 limitations on that are what I was mentioning, and others on the panel mentioned earlier about in-between status is the kind of put people in this very precarious role. That's freedom of movement. Another thing we're talking about is citizenship. Um, and one of the things that has, I think, happened over the last 50 years is, starting with the 1960s, is to really raise the question of thinking about the immigrants' rights as civil rights um, from the legislative genesis, but also in thinking about um, you think about racial profiling and, and, and traffic stops that lead to immigration enforcement. Um, lots of lots of this is in, in the rhetoric of civil rights. The th but beyond freedom of movement and national citizenship, we have a third issue, which is the one that Rachel named. Um, you can call it globalization. You can call it economic interdependence. You can think about it um, as economic integration. But one can imagine a world in which freedom of movement was less allied with national citizenship and more allied with economic integration. I'm not sure that's the best world to be in, but it is the regime you have more, more in the European Union, for example. And so I think, to me, the challenge is to think about 
Um, the gains that come from thinking about immigrant freedom of movement in association with the rights of national citizenship and the protections of national citizenship, but still recognize that the third piece of this is economic integration. And so this gets finally back, I think, Christina, to your question. I think much of this is, is, is to preserve those protections, but understanding that much of the real solutions here are not to be found in a domestic frame and to, for, for starters, to think, rethink, completely rethink uh, our, relation, our economic relationship with Latin America, for starters. Um, and, that's, and, and that's the challenge, is, to, is to, not, but to move in that direction, but not to so overemphasize that direction that we, we give up the civil rights gains and somehow um, allow, essentially, um, Monsanto, uh, or to decide what our uh, immigration policy is going to be as a function of trade agreements. That's just kind of a three-part way of thinking about what the major, what the big thing is, and bringing the globalization piece into the immigrants' rights, civil rights piece. I want to, to think about your question about how do we discuss inequality, immigration, and workers all in the same kind of frame. And I think it's super important for the movement to get this because corporations already do, certainly. And, and in discussing all of this, they are benefiting no matter where they're able to locate and ex exploit workers, immigrants in particular, those who are here, those who are in detention centers for months, um, profiting off of their incarceration the way that they profit off of other forms of incarceration. And if you call your credit card, you know, all these different corporations for customer service, you're likely calling Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, the places where most people are being deported to who have the English language ability to be able to do that, but get paid so much less to do that work there. Corporations are benefiting from this system wherever they can locate them. And as workers, as migrants, as deportees, there is that chance to make those connections about how that entire system is exploitative. Yes. <laughs> Um, and as I'm listening, I think what was coming up for me as well is even within, even within our own movement, there have been layers as to why folks have been excluded. Um, and particularly what comes up is the labor movement in the beginning, right? Progressive spaces that were predominantly just white. If you were of any other ethnicity, you were not welcomed in these spaces. Um, and within the Latino community, immigrant community in particular, I mean, that's still happening, but what's so powerful about the Fight for 15 movement is that this movement is taking a different face. It's taking a different shape, um, and it is including various narratives. We just had a Fight for 15 action where we had a woman that's been working at McDonald's. Uh, for 11 years, she only makes $8 an hour, 10 cent raises every year. She has three children, and she's not sure how she's going to get them to college. Mm -hmm. There's a black man also that he is a war veteran, and he's making the same amount of money, $8. I mean, these, these things, and these are grown people, right? Like the idea that um, it's young white kids, right, that are like working there, and they're just trying to transition out after they're out of college. That's, that's gone. But I think um, particularly what's so powerful is that there, there is an intersection on values now, the value of my work, the respect that I deserve as a worker, um, that unions are acknowledging, also that the, the demographics of this country are changing. Um, so I just wanted to bring that into the space. Yeah. So, uh, very quickly, um, I, I neglect to say this before, the, the Fight for 15 movement is one where uh, very recently you had Black Lives Matter advocates working, fighting, advocating alongside with immigrant rights mm -hmm. leaders. I mean, this is, this is incredible, right? This is an amazing, uh, an amazing thing. I think this question of exploitation, uh, of access, of surveillance, um, uh, of detention, incarceration. These are places where, uh, where these groups that often don't see eye to eye uh, are pitted against one another really come 
really to come together. And uh, I think we really have to take notice of this. And as, as scholars of act activists ourselves, to find ways to, to bolster the, the efforts that are being made. And I would just say, in Hiroshi, in response um, to your comment about uh, movement and law, I've really been very interested in thinking, it has been mostly domestically, but I think it, it responds to your question about international, of sort of trying to, trying to trace out uh, a law around, the law of movement, right? Uh, going back to the Dust Bowl uh, and barriers to movement for indigent whites, uh, looking at barriers to movement for black migrants moving from the South to the North, Communities saying, uh, in much the way that I hate to say it, my governor Christie said, "We're not going to take these refugees." Very similar uh, actions taken by uh, localities with respect to black uh, migrants. So I, I think I think it can be very useful for those of us in this room to try to to try to understand that law of movement and then to link it up internationally as well. So I want to play off this idea of the law of movement. I think that we are starting to develop a very palpable sense of the variety of injustices or inequalities or problems that exist in this space. Um, and certainly Alex's video makes that um, emotional, perhaps something Madhavi was calling for in the, the first session. Um, so, but I have a question related to this concept of movement. I want to direct it at Jennifer, because it also relates to what you were saying about the way the law creates different statuses. And I think you could ask this question of the criminal justice setting, but I'll put it in immigration law terms. And it's also relevant to the way advocates um, interact with people they're trying to persuade. What do you say uh, to the claim that those who have unauthorized status are complicit in the creation of that status, which I think is the kind of thinking that is one of the chief obstacles to immigration reform. But it's not just an obstacle to a legalization program. It also implicates this notion that if you have borders, there are going to be varieties of restraints on movement that will then create people who are complicit in being on the wrong side of the law. And we might debate the validity or, or um, legitimacy of that law at any given point, but it's a, it's a legitimate debate to have. So in thinking about the statuses that the law creates and the challenges associated with movement across borders, um, what do you say to the problem of complicity? So I, I um, appreciate the fact that Hiroshi began the panel by sort of reminding us about the framework that we have, which is the 1965 immigration law. Both both Hiroshi, Kevin, and Christina, I think, have talked about uh, the, the the complicated story that we can tell about how we uh, decide um, who's authorized and who's unauthorized, and maybe the um, insensitivities, whether deliberate um, or or accidental, um, that create. Uh, broad categories of people that we now call illegal or undocumented, the people that sort of fall uh, outside. Um, and so when we think about complicity, um, we tend to heap blame on the migrant uh, when in fact it is a, a complicit system, right? That one that where there were longstanding ties of uh, labor dependence and interrelationships, um, longstanding familial ties, um, very complex uh, intergenerational historical linkages between places that were disrupted by law. Um, and I think we need to sort of take a step back and, and ask who's complicit in the creation of unauthorized status. And it tends to, it actually, I think when we ask it that way, it implicates a lot more of us um, than I think many people are sort of comfortable acknowledging. So, um, I, I, and I here I sort of want to gesture um, to Lacey's work, which is very powerful, about where we, where we apply the violence of that sort of narrative of of, of status, where we who who we treat with violence when we label someone unauthorized, and I think that's that's a call for us to step back and say, yes, we have these categories that we created, uh, so, somewhat counter historically and somewhat counter economically, um, and and we need to think about sort of what was wrong um, with that, um, and, and and that will help us perhaps rethink how we frame um, questions of what will be permissible flows of migration going forward. Um, I think it's really 
you know, when we think about the histories of exclusions in this country and waves of exclusion, we can think about uh, the, the quote unquote repatriation of the 1930s of Mexican families, right? People who were citizens mm -hmm. um, and non citizens of Mexico who were deported uh, really largely through informal actions of states and localities. We can look at Operation Wetback of 1954, where over a million, uh, hundreds of thousands of, 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 of Mexicans um, in all manner of statuses, including citizens, again, uh, were caught up in a wave of mass, uh, of mass deportation, and we can think about the historic linkages that those people have in this country. How many citizenship claims will we, ne will we never unearth? How many, um, how many stories of disrupted um, home are there in those legacies? And I think those are the sorts of questions we have to ask when we sort of apply the facile label of undocumented or unauthorized. There are m many more complicated tales that we have of interdependence that need to be exposed. That, of course, is the the touchy-feely um, an academic uh, answer um, that, that's that's really difficult, I think, to have in the political space. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the in the political sphere, there is something that's very powerful about t saying that somebody is illegal, that somebody made a choice um, to migrate that was mm -hmm. illegal. And that same <clears throat> power we can see operating in the criminal justice sphere, right? When somebody is labeled a felon or when somebody has been labeled a criminal, a whole host of consequences flow from that, civil and criminal. Um, in, that, that reverberate into the employment sphere, the educational sphere, access to housing, access to wealth, um, that I think we need to think about very critically. And I think one of the nice things about having this panel and thinking about um, Robin talking about the synergies of the Black Lives Matter movement and the Dreamers is we can think about those same kinds of synergies and their possibilities when we think about the criminal justice reform discussions that are underway, um, where we're really rethinking um, some of the, uh, the logics of mass incarceration, some of the naturalization of, uh, of crime, criminality um, that, has, that has played out in very racialized ways. Um, and we can rethink in the same way some of the naturalization of illegality <clears throat> in the immigration space um, and ask if we can sort of reclaim um, some, <laughs> some more historically rooted um, account of what's happened there, just as we're trying to reclaim uh, through narratives like Michelle Alexander's The New Jim, Jim Crow, a more historically resonant account of what's happened in the criminal justice sphere. And I think that sort of reconstruction is what we need to engage in if we want to have productive civil rights discourse um, in this area. Marielena, then Elena. Um, so I just wanted to respond, um, one, about the complicit uh, question, and then second, a different angle about this issue of uh, freedom of movement. So on the complicit question, um, I guess I, I ask a, a different question, which is, Yes, one could argue that somebody who's been deported, let's say a father um, who's been deported and has U.S. citizen children, has left his family here, he's been deported, he comes back to the United States and tries to reenter um, and is detained at the border and is now a felon um, and is the type of person, the profile of the Latino man who has unlawfully reentered and is now part of what's filling our prison system um, with Latino men who are now felons because they re-entered. And if you ask him, he will say, yes, I made the decision, intentional decision to come back to the United States unlawfully. But why? Because his children and his family are here. It's the same reason that a mother over the last couple of years, mothers from Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador have made a perilous 25 plus day journey to the United States to take her daughter away from El Salvador because she was being either threatened with or actually um, engaged, her, the gang members in her neighborhood um, gang raped her, right? Any mother would do that. Every, every single mother that I have interviewed have, has been in the detention centers have said, I did what was best for my daughter, for my children. We made the decision to come here. And so, yes, complicit, but what would you do, right? What would the reasonable mother or father do um, for their children and for just from a human right perspective? So I guess that's just a question I throw out there. And then second, I think the other piece on freedom of movement, not so much with respect to the immigration laws at the federal level, but what happens at the state level when driving should not at all have to do with immigration, right? We, as all those of us who are drivers, who have a driver's license, you get in that car, you get into a car accident, you hope that person has a driver's license, has insurance, and can, you know, hopefully help pay for whatever damage. You want to make sure the person has gone through the testing necessary to get a driver's license. It shouldn't matter what their immigration status is or where they were born, but what many states have done, particularly after 9-11, 
by conflating terrorism and the hijacking of the planes that um, brought on the tragedy of 9-11 is to deny the freedom of movement within the state boundaries of individuals having the ability to pay for and take a driver's license, pay for insurance, and get a, a access to driver's license so that they can simply get in the car and drive their child to school. Right, That freedom of mobility within the state boundaries or across state, state boundaries um, is also at the crux. And frankly, it's actually the arguments that Texas is using against the president's executive action, the cost of providing driver's licenses to people with work authorization is what is bringing this case to the Supreme Court. So both Hiroshi and Lacey, now Alex, also want to get on this question. But if I could just add into the mix the question, you may or may not uh, choose to address this with whatever it is you're planning to say. Uh, but how, how then, in light of these things, do we rethink the logics of immigration? Because it seems that the obvious implication of what you're suggesting is that borders are unjust or they create injustices and where they do we should ignore them. But you don't have to be Donald Trump to think that a country has to have an immigration system. And even one that's quote unquote saner than the one that we have is still going to replicate unauthorized statuses. So so how do we think about the relentless logic of the nation state and the border in the context of what you're describing because it's hard uh, to reconcile those two. Roshi. Okay, should I answer that question or the, what, you, the you first can, one? You can, or whatever okay. you're going to say before. Um, yeah. Okay. Let, let me let me let me try to briefly address both. I mean, the 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 phrase actually that gets me most worked up in the response to the first question is the rule of law, um, because and I'll just focus on the example of executive action that is that Mary Lane has brought up and 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 just now and has come up on the panel several times. It's interesting to think about the, how the rule of law operates on this question. And this gets back to complicity because, uh, and from one perspective, and I think this is the state of Texas's perspective, um, we have the rule of law means to enforce the law against 11 million people. Um, but when we think about how executive action arose, uh, there were prosecutorial discretion uh, guidelines that the administration issued uh, in an attempt to really prioritize uh, these many deportations for the administration, actually. But then what you had is field agents uh, basically saying, what prosecutorial discretion guidelines? In fact, initially, they were the, uh, the main, the, 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 one of the ICE officers' agents' unions refused to have let their um, people go to training, and there were a lot of, um, there were a lot of uh, inconsistencies and I think a lot of discriminatory application of those guidelines. And so really what the executive action does is it brings the rule of law into the deportation system uh, you know, in, 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 in a way that really, in some ways, um, uh, for the first time, by providing an application a fee and, and also removing that power from uh, local agents in the field to make up immigration law and, and centralizing it in a place that was more transparent. And so this, this this really gets to this question of really how you know what what this this gets really in a sense to your to the question you just posed, which is you know how we think about these 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 legal rules. I mean, I think that. Um, that there are a lot of issues with, of course, national borders and the fact that there are people who are going to be on the outside. But the borders that we have now are so far apart from the defensible version of those that that is a problem. And I think that it's a serious problem. And I think that the, a lot of the answer really does have to go beyond um, just the civil rights framing and really give people a choice to stay and live lives. Where, I mean, we, we shouldn't, you know, of course, presume that people all want to come to this country because, of course, a lot of people come here because they feel they have no choice. And I think that that's, that's, that's the way I, I at least start to get at the second question. Mm -hmm. Lacey. Uh, let me say that I've talked to dozens and dozens of people, migrants, people who have migrant parents who haven't been able to see them in an average of 10 years because of immigration policy, and the vast majority of them say that they never wanted to be here, they never wanted to migrate. The vast majority of them really value their culture, the food, they love being able to go to the beach and hang out by the volcano, which is a common thing in Central America. Um, and they are very aware now that coming to the US means being 
a low-wage worker, heavily discriminated against, possibly attacked, they understand that they don't want that for themselves. And so it's really important both within the movement and in our scholarship to think beyond what happens in the U.S. and to think that the laws that are passed here only affect what happens within its borders. The U.S., through its foreign and economic policies, has created a a reality in which people, no matter how hard they work, will not, never be able to provide the basics for their families. Mm -hmm. And so in that situation, the only reasonable thing to do is to leave. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about you know, the law and you know, all of these things, we're erasing the realities that we create through free trade agreements, the realities that we create through this massive deportation regime that we've had. Um, and, and we can't do that to really understand what's going on. Alex? Yeah, I wanted to pull out a story of a family that I met uh, doing work in McAllen on this question of movement. This family has been in the U.S.-Mexico border um, in Texas for 23 years. They have family in Wisconsin and they also have family in Reynosa, Mexico, where that's the part of the border that they're at. Um, but that family has not been able to move from that section for 23 years. They have not been able to see their family. The family in Wisconsin can't come see them. They can't go see their family. They can't go to Mexico to visit their mother because they are stuck in this in-between space. So there's mm -hmm. a larger conversation about mobility um, or movement, but there's also like where people can't move. So there's actually communities that are completely stuck in border towns because of the checkpoints. Mm -hmm. So that's a big question for me and like um, as we're addressing this because that family also didn't want to just come to the United States. The mom was facing uh, domestic violence and so she fled because she didn't know where else to go and what to do. Christina, can I just um, add, I think, um, because so much of what we're talking about, I think people usually think, well, it's immigration reform. We need federal legislation to resolve this and to address this issue. But, I mean, I think as Hiroshi and Lacey, you referenced this as well, in fact, so much of the push and pull factors really the, the solution lies in economic policy and foreign policy, et cetera. And in so many communities... Um, in particularly in Latin America, which which is what I know, but this is true, I think, of, of um, families that I've spoken to in India and other places, is there is a a growing sentiment of the right to remain. Like, how can people across the world have the right to remain in their homes, in their communities? And what does it mean? And that gets us into this whole other conversation about international law and human rights law and the militarization and the role of globalization and capitalism that force people to migrate um, and environmental disasters, et cetera. I mean, so it's a much more complex um, issue that probably requires another conference. <laughs> it probably would, uh, but it, it does also point to the, the difficulty of addressing some of the underlying uh, causes of the problems that you've all identified because there are so many uh, interlocking parts and interests that are in conflict with one another. I want to ask just one last question of the panelists, and then we'll open it up to questions. It's a, it's a question that I'm sure a lot of people have been asking themselves, and I would really like, personally like, the answer to from a group of immigration law and advocacy experts. Uh, and that's whether we should be thinking about this particular moment in American politics as an unusually nativistic moment, whether we should be worried about the future of all of these transformations of systems that the we're saying are necessary to uh, bring justice to this domain? Or is this something that is part of the warp and woof of American politics, the way that the Republican primary has um, treated the immigration issue, the resistance to the resettlement of Syrian refugees, and a variety of other things that you could put all within um, the, under the label of a movement against immigration. Is this something um, that is potentially transformative and therefore styming of all of the work that, uh, that you're interested in, or is it something that we can get past uh, with ordinary forms of advocacy? Well, I'm reminded of what Joe and Lai said when he, when the former Chinese premier, I think it was in the 70s, was asked what he, what it affects the French Revolution, and he says it's too soon to tell. <laughs> um, um, 
You know, I, I, I'm not. You know, I, I'm not sure. I think you're asking the right question. Um, and my my sense, my my optimistic self says that we've that this country has been through cycles of this. But my realist self says that we can't be sanguine in that statement. Uh, sort of, um, and and so uh, the the difficulty here is that. Um, so much, I think, sort of, so much of the law that I think of as bad law was created in these moments of where, like the McCarthy period, um, for example, that still is with us for, um, for constitutional precedents. And so, um, yeah, I, I, we, we've been we've been through this before, but each 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 iteration of it, I think, is has has has. Um, let me just stop there because I'm just not I'm not sure. <laughs> I see. Um, I'll say that there are lots of days when I feel a little bit hopeless. Um, I don't tell my students that. But I also think it's such an incredible moment, the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the migrant rights movement, the Fight for 15, and the way that these groups are using social media to so quickly get their message out, to see the solidarity happening nationwide, to make these things visible, and to humanize people who haven't had that representation in mainstream media ever before. That part gives me hope, and, and there really is this moment to see where this generation of leaders is going to take us and what role we can play in supporting them. Um, so, so in that sense, I think it is a unique moment. Alex? Um, so this moment does feel very special in that there is there's a true intersection now that's actually happening. So it's not kind of like um, where we have an action on the ground. It's like, oh, hey, somebody go bring a clergy member. A clergy member is already part of a coalition. Mm -hmm. And a person, persons of color are strategizing together to see how we can advance a platform versus just a tactic, right, or just that moment. So I think that what the Black Lives Matter did was such an important thing, and I think that it's really changing the face of how we organize, because it's bringing up a dialogue that maybe all of us were a little bit complicit. I know even myself, right, sometimes like, oh, I don't want to talk about race, because then that's just going to open up oh, like a can of worms. And But it's such a conversation that needs to happen, that honesty that needs to happen so that we can actually get past and find those common spaces where we can actually organize together and change what's happening. And I think just to close, um, what's happening on the right is part of right their 40-year plan, but also they saw an opportunity for me in the immigration space in particular in 2006 when we had those giant marches, right? There was all of this movement, all of this activity, and it scared them because they saw a demographic that was really growing and a power that was really scary. And so I think that they have now been re-strategizing, but I think it's been to our benefit because it's been really activating our base, and we're not in a we're not in a space where we weren't ready. We have been organizing for quite some time, and we're righteously angry, <laughs> making sure that we're fighting back. Mm -hmm. Robin, uh, to answer Christina's question, I would just say uh, I'm both terrified. The idea that we're spending this much time talking about Donald Trump mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. he said is really frightening to me. Mm -hmm. uh, that he could be ahead in the polls, I think, should give us all pause. Mm -hmm. That is a that is a, a terrifying uh, possibility that he would become. Uh, our president. Um, so uh, I hope I hope and pray that won't happen. But just the idea that we're talking about him, I think, uh, is is for me very scary. And at the same time, I agree with everyone else that this is a moment for some optimism uh, to see the kind of uh, movement, engagement, activism on the ground. Uh, but I don't think I sort of think. Your question needed a second part, right? So if, if you are, if there is some reason for optimism, what do we do, right? How do we support what's happening on the ground? And I, I do think uh, for us here, t 
Ted, Ted Shaw maybe isn't here right now, but he said earlier, you know, we need to get out of the way. You're still there. <laughs> you said get out of the way of what the young people are, uh, are, are doing. And I, I think that's sort of right, right? So you don't want to manage it because there's a force, there's a power to what's going on. But I think we do have to think about, think very strategically about how to support it, about uh, maybe helping to identify places where there are these synergies. Uh, the idea of mass car incarceration of a student who's working on a paper that is about uh, bringing together the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, a focus on detention uh, for undocumented uh, uh, persons in this country, right? Let's have that be, uh, be our focus. Mm -hmm. I think questions about family uh, and incarceration in that context, about removal of children away from their families is something that is another place of sort of commonality. And of course, I already identified uh, work, but sort of once we've done that, I think we then have to think about what are the what are the what are the structures that we need to prop up these these efforts. We haven't we've talked a lot about sort of bad immigration law uh, and what we would do, but I think there are other places where law might be able to support some of these efforts. If you think about in workplaces, workplaces where there's been strong anti-discrimination norms, where policies are actually uh, enforced, are places where there's often greater solidarity. We can do something about that as legal scholars. We can think harder about how to promote those things. And so, so I, wanna, I want us to focus on the, all right, so what uh, part of it, because I think it's, uh, it's critical. So a final brief remarks from Jennifer, Maria Elena, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, just really briefly, I think Robin has said a lot of what I was going to say. I think that you asked if this is a, sort of a, a, a uniquely dangerous moment. I think there are uh, dangerous things that are being said that resonate very deeply with historical dangerous things that have been said about migrants. So, so it's a, another perilous moment, um, but also a moment where there are strong voices speaking back. And I think we need to think about how we provide a megaphone for those strong voices. On the last panel, there was discussion about um, the, the lots of money that helps to back up a, a, a Tea Party voice. And I do think we need to think very strategically about um, what kind of academic megaphones and, and, and other megaphones can be brought to bear so that uh, so that the whole discourse doesn't just shift in the direction of the loudest voices, um, and that's that's always the danger. Um, and I, I think the other thing that we probably want to think about is what are the conversations that we need to be having about what immigration is going to look like. I mean, one of the kind of funny things about the Republican debates is you know they're talking about migration as if Mexican unauthorized Mexican migration is the biggest problem that America faces, and it's not. Um, I mean, statistically, it's not, and, and net migration from Mexico is at zero and below. And, and I think we need to be thinking very hard about what the future of migration is and what our laws need to look like to sort of reflect what the future of migration is going to be in this country, because the discussions that are actually being had in the political spaces um, on right and left aren't really reflecting the demographic, um, economic, and social realities of what migration uh, will be in the coming centuries. Mm -hmm. So really quickly, um, like Robin, um, I am terrified, but not so much about Trump. I'm more terrified about the people who are supporting him, right? The get, the folk, you know, the 20,000 people who went to a, a, to watch him in Alabama, who then talked about, yeah, everybody should go volunteer and go to the border and get paid 50 bucks per every immigrant they kill. Um, or in South Boston, um, the two men from South Boston who urinated on a homeless Latino man and said, yes, D Donald Trump was right. That is what concerns me. And I think there's something about this moment that whether it's anti-Mexican, anti-Latino, um, the, the criminalization and, and policing and killing by the police of black men and black, black women and children, um, whether it's anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, I mean, there's so anti-women, um, anti-choice, there's so much um, this increase of repression that's happening, so much otherness by a small minority, mm -hmm. right? And what happens when that small minority is feeling like they're losing their grip on power and what violence that unleashes. So that's terror. The hope, very, very hopeful. I think because of the moment that we're living in, there is um, a really inspiring convergence that's happening across movements. I was just last month in, Nor um, in New Orleans at a conference of um, 
movement for Black Lives Matter, education reform, economic justice, and immigrant justice that the United We Dream Network and the National Immigration Law Center worked with a number of other partners in organizing. And I have to say, and the majority of the people from all of those movements were young people, super inspiring, just really gave me a sense of like, we're going to be all right. Thanks for ending on that optimistic. <laughs> um, I'd like to open it up for questions. We have about 15 minutes. Uh, yes, in the front. Just let me please bring say you your, your name when you ask your question. Hi, I'm Osamulia James. I'm from the University of Miami. And I wanted to talk about the use of narratives in this work. Watching the film was so moving. But I also get concerned about the good immigrant versus bad immigrant narrative um, and how that shapes how we talk about it. Because, because, you know, who gets caught up into good or bad is socially constructed. Because politics of respectability, you can never win. And because it it shifts our attention. We focus on exceptions, let the good ones in and keep the bad ones out, as opposed to talking about how the larger system operates. And this also happens in the criminal justice system, too, where we have sort of good people in jail who shouldn't be there than the bad ones, instead of thinking about why do we incarcerate people the way we do? Um, and so I wonder if we could, if, if the panelists would talk about how we create empathy, why we use these images and narratives to create empathy, but in ways that don't shift our focus to the larger structural problems that need to be addressed, regardless of you know, whether someone deserves or doesn't deserve to be caught up in that system. I mean, I'll start, yeah, you're completely onto something. And there's a lot of work happening right now in broader movements, not just in the immigrant justice movement, of really trying to challenge this whole notion of deserving and undeserving, good versus bad immigrant. And that's, that happens in all communities, but the immigration system per se does that. Um, and, and particularly on this, the criminal versus non-criminal. I mean, we have fought so hard within the immigrant rights movement with our allies to be like, no, 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 do not say we're not criminals. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like that, no, no, that reinforces that other people are criminal. What does that do between the black-brown divide in particular? But second, guess what? We are criminals. We are being criminalized by unjust laws. Um, and so how do we counter that? And I'll just give a little tiny, like really, really minuscule victory, which is a year ago when President President Obama announced these executive actions and the enforcement priorities, the prioritization by itself is that same dynamic of these are priorities to deport, these people are not, so these are unworthy of being here, these are worthy of staying. Then the framing the White House came up with was we, we want, um, we're going to deport felons, not families. Well, many in the immigrant rights community said, no, guess what? That father who is coming back and is now a felon should not be you know, criminalized. And so I was just at a meeting at the White House two days ago to prepare for this whole Supreme Court stuff, and they shared that they finally dropped the felons, not families. Framing, framing. So tiny little victory. God knows what they're going to come up now. It's probably a framing <laughs> we still don't like, but at, the, at least like, and that was pressure from the grassroots. Yeah, so much of the narrative. I mean, this is a real problem that you identify, and I think so much of the narrative that is dangerous is a narrative that is really uh, developed in the current moment. And and so I think that. Historical narrative is not as powerful as present narrative, but I think it's super important. Um, an example of this is this whole rhetoric around legalization or amnesty. It, it treated as if it's an exceptional sort of thing, but in fact, I mean, first of all, legalizations and amnesties have taken place historically for, for many years, and I think that one of the more unsettling, or I mean, in the sense of, of, of jarring ideas, is really the whole law of asylum is a, is a law of legalization. But we don't even think of it that way. And so, and, 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 and I think so many people don't know the history of Chinese exclusion, for example, um, and, or the history of Mexican labor migration and, and exploitation in the early 20th century. And so those are narratives, too. And I think that, um, that, that they're often forgotten. Robin. I, I would just say, Asamudi, in, res in response to your question, that um, uh, um, I think these narratives are important in sort of shaping the broader debate. And we've been talking about it at, at that level. But I think. Um, sort of retuning, reshaping the narr narratives that get uh, get expressed, communicated, are important for the intergroup interactions that are at the center of movements like the Fight for 15. That you know, very often uh, the the histories of the respective groups are not understood, are not known, and those are barriers to. Solidarity. I think one of the things Black Lives Matters has said is it's told these stories in ways that sort of resonate 
with other groups. And I, I think we have to find ways to tell um, to tell our stories across groups in ways that build up uh, the kinds of movements uh, that we're seeing and are excited about. So I saw Ming Chen's hand, and then over here there was a question. Um, I'm Ming Chen from the University of Colorado. Um, first, I just want to thank the organizers for including this topic, and no less on a plenary session um, in a conference about civil rights. I feel like that doesn't happen off enough, so I really appreciate that. Um, to our panel, um, a number of you, um, Jennifer Hiroshi in particular, but I think also um, all of our people who are on the ground or in conversation with people who are on the ground, um, have alluded to the additional obligations that we owe to immigrants that go beyond the pale of current discussions about immigration reform. Um, and you know, I, I distinctly remember a moment not that long ago, you know, calling up a friend in DC, um, just talking about the mood, right? And, and he was saying like, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, we're no longer talking about legalization. Now we're talking about pathway to citizenship. Like there was just so much hope and optimism. And I kind of feel like that moment is slipping away. Um, so I guess I wondered if you could just share some of your ideas, you know, some of your vision for where we could be going, um, if we could just admire ourselves from the current moment. Who wants to tackle that one first? <laughs> My vision for the future? Um, well, you know, uh, it, uh, some of this, I think, has to do with um, the incrementalism here and how you think about the political process. And I think that if there's any, anything I've learned over the last 10 years in being involved in some of these, um, I, I would call debates within the movement, is that um, I believe in the power of the small um, changes. So think about um, uh, sort of the cycle of how things have gone from the local to the federal over the last um, 10 years. And there's a lot of, you know, I'm going to generalize about the causation here, but I mean, I think that um, one of the great things that, um, that in-state tuition did throughout the country was to lay the foundation um, for uh, a claiming of identity that Lacey, for example, has written a, a really powerful piece about um, among students that then led to of the federal uh, DACA, um, which I think then led, in many respects, back in state lo local law to driver's licenses. And so this goes back to the optimism question. I think that my fundamental optimism comes from that type of grassroots. And so my, my, my vision is one, actually, of, of um, sort of incremental, irresistible change. And so, for example, uh, I think one of the political debates has been whether or not immigrants' rights advocates should, quote, settle, end quote, for um, not having to path to citizenship as part of legislation. It's interesting because I think that it's the most antithetical thing uh, to what it, this country means is to not have the path to citizenship. And yet part of me also wonders if people have the right to work, people have the right to drive, um, doesn't that, isn't that going to create a, such a powerful movement for having the path to citizenship that will actually be shorter? Uh, in, 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 in its realization than the 13-year path of citizenship that is in the law, <laughs> you know. And so that's, that, that's you know, um, that's the way I think about um, the vision. In some ways, the vision consists of these very small things that I think inevitably lead to change. And a lot of it is extremely uh, grassroots, not just in the sense of um, community organizing, but also in the sense of local politics. I, I think I would add the vision that, that I agree, kind of the small things matter, and 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 um, kind of legislation that we see at the state level in California um, around driver's licenses, around misdemeanor sentencing, all of those things that uh, demonstrate that you have great power there. I think I also, though, would want us to think big. Um, right now, I think the question that we're asking is what kind of gated community we want to live in. And I think the question that we ha want to have as our ultimate end question is, do we want to live in a gated community? Um, and I, I think that's a conversation that is maybe centuries off, um, but it should be a lodestar that still guides our conversations now, too. Alex. Yes. Um, so for in these moments, we use that struggle, that pain, to really fuel the next fight. And so we take this kind of like national difficulty and we start to really work on like the local wins that um, folks are mentioning that is spot on, right? Like what, what advancements have we made 
building the base, um, being able to really develop leaders for when we get to another moment that we can actually move the conversation on a national level toward um, jumping into another citizenship fight, we're ready. Um, so for us, that's kind of how we operate. So it's, it's kind of like a, we'll stop here for now refocus ourselves, mm -hmm. re-strategize, so that when, when that time comes, we can actually push the conversation. So just really quickly, I think um, we're at a moment, a really pivotal moment in the immigrant justice world, which is there's been so much of the focus on strategy um, has been on federal legislation as the answer. And really, I would actually counter a, a different perspective from what Hiroshi and um, Jennifer have said is I actually don't think that the, I th the victories that we're having at the state and local level are not small. At the end of the day, what they're about is we are trying to make a difference in people's lives today mm -hmm. so that they have a sense of dignity, safety, and belonging. That is not small. That is big. When you feel that you at your core matter, whether you are a black person or whether you were born in another country, that is huge. And I think that will empower us to build a level of political power we need to get federal legislative reform done at a different point. Mm -hmm. Lacey. And just, just to follow all that up, I think it's so important and and gives hope. The fact that we are seeing movements that do have specific kind of policy goals and all of that that we've seen in the past, but that also at their core are about being recognized as full human beings, about recognizing each other's dignity. And that also is super powerful. All of these marginalized groups, communities that are seeing that and are seeing the dignity in each other. So let's uh, take two questions. That will be, those will be our final questions. There was one over here and uh, then uh, Hari in the back. Or there's one, where are you pointing? Christine. Oh, okay, yes, please, here and then up there. Sorry, Hari, uh, you already you had a question in the first round. Go ahead. Here in the front. I know, she does, I don't have a mic. Could you oh, bring the yeah. microphone? Do we have a mic back there? Though? Yeah. He should go. Go, go, go. Me or someone else? Okay. <laughs> So I guess one, one part of the movement that I wanted to raise up, because we're talking about the fight for 15, is um, carrying across generations and the domestic uh, workers' movements that are really powerful because it's such a connection between you know, a history of violence against um, women, um, African-American women caregivers that were you know, ex, you know, um, freed slaves that then went into being caretakers. And now we've gone into a movement of organizing both um, African-American, African immigrant, and uh, Latina uh, you know, caregivers into you know, fighting for uh, a sense of dignity in their workplace, for, for wages, for safety, for sexual harassment. And I think it's just a wonderful thing that, that should be raised up because it's, it's, it's such an intersectional um, movement. Um, but one question that I, wanted to ha that I have is when we talk about you know, the good migrant and the bad migrant, I think sometimes there's a difference between, you know, why has, um, why has the domestic workers movement been so successful? I think a part of it is because immigrant women as caretaker, immigrant women as mother, immigrant women as the good woman is really a, a, a really great idea to, to latch onto and to mobilize around. But like farm worker women who are, you know, raped in, the, like rape in the fields is an amazing documentary. Yep. That is, it's a sad story that happens all the time with farm worker women. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to mobilize around um, changing workplace practices and those kind of settings. And is it, is it because there's a difference in how we define um, immigrant women as being valuable as mother, as caretaker, and not as just being a human? So I just wanted to ask if that's something that you've seen in your work. And one final question up here. I wonder if there's a, a fantastic event that the civil rights framework blinds us from seeing, right? We've got all kinds of great things, some of which have been mentioned, happening right now, from prison abolition to the anti-globalization movements, like, like the EZLN and, and others, to Black Lives Matter, to Occupy Wall Street, to the Fight for 15, to Bernie Sanders, all kinds of things happening now, organized around a very simple to understand principle, 
the, the source of our suffering is the inhuman joy of the 1%. Mm -hmm. right? All those movements are organized around that very simple statement. And it, it, to me, it seems that that statement is the one that the system has always been organized to repress, whether it's from the redemption or the Red Scare or the McCarthy era or COINTELPRO or the, the globalized security state apparatus that we're living in now. It's, to, it's designed to suppress that that one idea that the source of our suffering is the sick joy of the one percent or one tenth of one percent. But we have that exposed all over now in fantastic ways and I wonder if going back to the civil rights framework which is already prepared for us, right, the one percent are prepared to battle on that civil rights terrain. That's a very small box and you don't get very far um, and you can't get this message out uh, in that way. If that's, if that's kind of a movement back to a blind alley, right? We're kind of a, like Sophocles in reverse. We're, we're wedded to the wrong thing and then blinded. Or I guess here, we're blinded, then wedded to the wrong thing, right? We, we, we can't see this through civil rights. There are all these wild and great movements happening that are exposing it. But then we take it back to civil rights uh, where it's uh, erased even in moments of, uh, of victory. So I wonder if we can comment on the responsibility of lawyers, right? to make sure that we're not taming fantastic events that are beyond our ken, beyond our skill set, um, maybe even you know, beyond what we want to do. We might be wedded to the system that has given us all the you know, nice things like our cars and tenure and all of that. So, so I, maybe a response to that would be something uh, uh, interesting. So Anthony Farley is my name. I'm at Albany. So we're nearly out of time, but I'll give uh, anyone on the panel who would like to address one of the two questions um, 30 seconds. Uh, less than my two minutes. I'll say just really quickly, I, appreci I really appreciate your comment about the intergenerational nature of, the, uh, of this movement. It's important because we have, we, that's true on the ground for the people who were there, but it's also true because I think it paints a picture about uh, the dead in nature of low wage work and how uh, limited that type of uh, uh, a path to citizenship or belonging that work has has been, and it's done that over time. I think that in parts gets to Anthony to your comment. I think by by showcasing that, by showcasing how limited a path this has been, it, it gives us a way around the old civil rights. It's sort of saying. The, the sort of formal notion of equality is not enough, right? What we're talking about is substantive belonging, uh, dignity in a way that we have not seen it or understood it in the past. And I think those, I think what we see on the ground, that push for civil rights is about that. It's something different. That's why all the organizers have the new civil rights right in the heading, because I think we, we are talking about something different, even if it rests on that foundation of the past. No final thoughts, Jennifer. Uh, just to, just quickly, uh, I I I also appreciated the way that you sort of highlighted the the w w what what stories are easy to mobilize and what stories are difficult to mo mobilize around the gender dynamic. And I do think that one thing that we need to think about is the way that our immigration law, as it's currently structured, um, reifies gender hierarchies all over the place um, and 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 gender norms. Um, and so I think disrupting that is difficult in some ways, right? It's easier to play into the dominant norms. That's how you get um, things like VAWA relief and T and U visas, right? The dominant norm can sort of um, pull in relief that then winds up being wonderfully generative in a lot of ways. Like you get a lot of benefits that maybe some allies or supporters didn't foresee, which is great. Um, but, the, but, the, you know, but the downside is we are working within that system where, and, and it is important to sort of think disruptively about gender when we're thinking about these movements. And I think that's um, that's a hard question that we always have to keep coming back to. Um, and, and, and on the kind of 1% question, I guess I think as a, as a person who educates law students, one of the questions that I've been asking myself very critically lately is, what am I doing in the classroom that is contributing to this justice fiasco? Because I think as law professors, we have to sort of take accountability for what happens, what lawyers are doing in the world. Um, and that starts with day one of 1L, where many of us teach. Um, so I think it's really important for us to think about what, we, what values we inculcate in students when they come into the law school classroom uh, and start to rethink what it means to be a lawyer, what work doctrine does, 
and what it doesn't do, um, and what our role is um, as a, a as a servant to justice um, and a servant to the movements that generate justice, and not as the orchestrators uh, of of, uh, of of those movements. Um, so that's I think that's a hard question that we all need to engage in, perhaps in the separate legal education conference that we have on this topic. But I do think it's a critical one. So I hope we will continue to think disruptively today. And join me in thanking uh, the members of the wonderful panel. Very cool.